Today I want to present a case that has personally confused me and many others on the internet ever since 2014. I will go over the case as the evidence has been prepared and presented. Then I will go over a few theories as well as my personal thoughts on the matter. So now, please enjoy. March 15, 2014 marks the day that 21-year-old Chris Kramers and 22-year-old Lisanne Froon boarded a plane from Amsterdam to Costa Rica. From Costa Rica, the girls would travel to Bocas del Toro, Panama, and then to the island of Cologne, where for the next two weeks they would spend their time in Panama as a vacation. After those two weeks were up, on March 29th, the pair would arrive at their final destination of Boquet, Panama. Upon arrival in Boquette, the girls' plans changed from pure vacation to that of a volunteer trip for the local school there, as well as an opportunity for them to improve upon their Spanish-speaking skills. However, soon after, their appointments had changed. Staff at the children's school, Aura, told them that they could not work there that week as planned. The head of the children's school had other things to do elsewhere, and they had no time or place for them, despite earlier made agreements. Through the conversation with the head of the school, it was clear that Lasanne and Chris had been sent away, and this upset both of them very deeply as it put a very big damper on their plans. And this is all despite the fact that the girls had received an email on Friday confirming that they would be starting their work that following Monday. Though disappointed with the decision of the school, this led Lasanne and Chris to be making plans for the following week as they now had free time in their schedule. The girls stayed with a local host family in Alto Boquette, which was a neighboring town south of the city of Boquette. Resident of the host family, Miriam, often houses international students and had a room for the girls in the main house that had a separate entrance and key. Miriam described the two girls as smart and shy and also said that the two were restless after the decision of the school. Miriam recalled that Lasanne was not feeling too well and did not believe that the girls would be doing much over the next few days. However, starting on March 30th, the girls went out to explore the town of Boquette and were back before sunset. Lasanne and Chris are claimed to have planned all sorts of sightseeing tours for the next week, starting on Wednesday, April 2nd until Saturday. They made these plans with the help of a different Spanish-speaking school that they had contacted after being rejected by the first one. They showed interest in local day tours such as climbing the local volcano and visiting a local coffee plantation and a strawberry farm. However, they did not make plans for Tuesday, April the 1st. On Tuesday, April 1st, 2014, they set out on a hike on the Pianista Trail, which is a well-known path that brings walkers to a summit at around 8 kilometers distance from Boquette. Prior to the hike, the girls had posted on Facebook that they intended to walk around Boquette for the day. However, in a text to Chris's boyfriend, she had stated that they would be going on a hike on the trail that day. The taxi driver that drove them declared that he had dropped them off at the trail at 1.40 in the afternoon, and two staff members of the language school confirmed at the time that they had seen the girls leave there shortly after 1 p.m. But the clock on the digital camera owned by Lasanne suggests that Chris and Lasanne started their hike around 11 in the morning. This would be the first of many, many inconsistencies in the case. In preparation for the hike, Lisanne and Chris wore light clothing, just shorts and a tank top, and didn't bring much with them other than a light backpack, some money, their mobile phones, a separate digital camera, and a water bottle. All in all, their preparation was definitely for a short trip and not for an extended hike. Also supposedly accompanying the girls on their hike was a local dog named Blue, however he was never shown in any of the pictures that were recovered from the girls' phones and camera. The story of this dog Blue being with them is what rose the initial suspicions as the dog returned later that night without Chris and Lisanne. On the night of April 1st, upon realizing that Lisanne and Chris had not returned home, the host family is said to have searched around the general area around the home to see if they could find them. 
and then decided to give up on the search, assuming that the girls were just staying out late and that they would see them again sometime the next morning. The next morning, Wednesday, April 2nd, Miriam had assumed that Chris and Lasanne had returned overnight and were just sleeping in. That is, until a local tour guide showed up at the host family's home, claiming that the girls did not appear for their 8 a.m. appointment. After the tour guide Feliciano explained to Miriam that the girls had not shown up for their appointment, she guided him over to the side of the house where she kept a spare key to the room that they were staying in. Here it has been claimed that Feliciano spent at least 13 minutes searching the girls' room before leaving and then heading off to the Pianista Trail where they were last said to have gone. During the day, Feliciano supposedly searched the Pianista Trail for himself and then later in the afternoon got in contact with a staff member of the language school who then agreed to contact the local authorities. This agreement was made so late in the day that authorities would not begin their search for Lasanne and Chris until the following morning, April 3rd. Starting in the morning of April 3rd, authorities began their search on foot throughout the forest with the help of volunteers and later did aerial searches over the area. However, it was not very helpful considering the fact that the jungle was so dense it would be nearly impossible to see the girls through the vegetation. Over the course of the next few days as the search continued, no sign of the girls or their whereabouts were found though it was noted by many locals that were familiar with the trail that it was very hard to stray away from it if not intentionally, and they didn't view the trail itself as a particularly difficult one to traverse as long as they stuck to the path. When Lasanne and Chris's parents hadn't heard anything by April 6, one of the girl's parents boarded a plane along with detectives from the Netherlands. Together, police, dog units, and the Dutch detectives searched the forest for a solid 10 days. Chris and Lasanne's parents then offered a reward of 30,000 US dollars, which was a significant amount to Panamanian people, considering the average annual salary there was just around $25,000 though even this did not turn up any results. Nothing would come of the search until 10 weeks later on June 11th when a woman named Irma Mirando found Lasanne's blue Ligra backpack and it was handed to the police on June 13th. Irma and her husband found it near a rice paddy field stuck between a rock and the river on the bank of the river Calebre near the village of Alto Romero. The location in which the backpack was discovered was about 17 kilometers away from their host family's home in Boquette. In an interview, the woman who found the bag told the interviewer that she and her husband first called a local cattle rancher, later identified as the same local tour guide, Feliciano, about the finding and that he called the police for them and handed the bag to the police a day later. The condition in which the backpack was found was initially described as completely dry even though it was found next to a riverbed and the police explanation was that it was floated down by the river. Now this was not entirely true, it was neither described as wet or dry in the police reports, however all of the contents and technology inside of the bag seemed to be unharmed by the elements. Most of the speculation about the backpack and its contents condition came after a photo of it was released to the media in which most people agreed that it did not look like it had spent weeks in a wet, muddy jungle and river having endured 72-something days in a highly humid rainforest. Within the backpack was two folded up bras, two undamaged pairs of sunglasses, both girls' mobile phones, a Samsung Galaxy from Lasanne and a black iPhone from Chris, neither of which appeared to be damaged, and a digital Canon PowerShot SX270HS. On top of that, the backpack also contained an insurance identification card from Lasanne, a passport from Chris, 88 American dollars, and an empty water bottle. A total of 13 DNA samples were reported to have been taken from the straps, zippers, and edges of the backpack, some DNA was also found on the bras. Out of the 13 DNA samples though, DNA was only found on three of those samples. They turned out to belong to multiple people, including at least two different women and one man. But none of those DNA traces were ever matched to anyone. 
the DNA samples also did not match that of Chris and Lasanne, which appears very odd as they most certainly touched their own backpack and belongings, but their DNA may have been washed off by the river water. Fingerprint samples were also taken from the backpack and the contents of the backpack, and in local media it was reported that a total of 34 different fingerprints were found, 13 on the backpack, 12 on the phones and the camera, as well as 6 different ones on the bras. No fingerprints were properly recorded, however, from those helping in the searches and handling evidence that was found on the site. It has also been noted that Panamanian officials handled the evidence with very lazy care, as they were often seen without protective gloves that could have easily been blamed for the fingerprints that were found on a majority of the contents. With the discovery of the backpack and its contents, we were given data from the phones and camera left by Chris and Lasanne. These items appeared to give us a better understanding of what happened, but also created more questions to be left unanswered. The data found on the mobile phone usage showed that the girls were in distress much earlier than we had originally anticipated. Around 4.39 p.m. on April 1st, the day of their disappearance while it was still light out, the first attempted call to emergency services was made. At around 4.51 p.m., a second attempt was made. Both times, the Dutch emergency number 112 was dialed. Due to poor reception, neither of these calls went through, and the phones were powered off just after 5.52 p.m., and it took 14 hours for another attempt to be made to call emergency services. In the days that followed, more attempts to dial emergency services were made, not only through 112, but also by trying to call 911. The second day, April 2nd, was also the only day when one of their calls apparently made a short connection at 1.50 p.m. The call connected through Lasanne's Samsung and only stayed connected for about 1-2 to two seconds and then was abruptly cut off, either due to poor reception or to somebody intentionally turning off the phone. It is also noteworthy that the phone was turned off fully shortly afterwards. Between the last call on the second day and the first call of the third day sit 22 hours. On day 3, April 3rd, the Samsung phone from Lasanne had been powered on throughout the night between 2.21 and 2.41 a.m., a weather application was used on the Samsung phone. By 7.36 a.m., the Samsung had only about 1% battery left and was powered off. At 9.32, the iPhone 4 was powered on and 911 was called twice. Then the iPhone was powered off. The phone had no cell network connection and the call did not go through, like all call attempts, with the exception of the 1-2 to two second on day 2. By the morning of day 4, Lasanne's Samsung would reach 0% battery and would never properly boot up again. On day 5, the iPhone 4 was powered on and off at 10.50 AM. This was the last time the SIN pin was entered correctly. From then onward, the wrong pin code or no pin code was entered. Until then, the phone had successfully received both a SIM pin and a login pin to unlock the screen. At 1.37 p.m., the iPhone 4 was powered on and off, but the SIM pin code was either not entered or not entered correctly. But whomever entered the SIM pin either not or incorrectly must have known the login pin to unlock the phone. Whomever entered these incorrect pin codes failed to activate the phone, but in theory phones can still make emergency phone calls then. There is just no access to the phone data itself. On day 6, the iPhone 4 was powered on and off two different times throughout the day, again with the SIM pin either not entered or not entered correctly, and these would be the last times that the phones were attempted to be used before the 10th day. By these failed attempts at entering Chris's iPhone, it is safe to assume that whoever is trying to enter the phone is not Chris and that Chris is either incapacitated or has passed away. Whether the person who was trying to enter Chris's phone was Lasanne or a third party is still unknown. So between day 4 and 6, there had merely been a string of attempts to just find a reception signal through a specific pattern of daily times when the phones were switched on and off. Over time, they were used less and less to try and call emergency services. The phones were not used on days 7 through 9, 
Then suddenly, on day 11, on April 11th, Chris's iPhone was powered on again at 10.51 a.m. and stayed on for one hour and four minutes. The phone was then powered off with some battery remaining, but it was the last time that it was used. The final thing of note when it comes to Lasanne and Chris's phone is that there were no unsent text messages found in their phones, no goodbye messages in any shape or form, which was confirmed by Dutch investigators and the parents. The case files and the parents and their representatives have all confirmed that no text messages were found, drafted, or attempted to be written or sent by Chris and Lasanne. Now, Lasanne Froon's camera provides us another interesting look into the trip that can even be disturbing at times. The camera has no GPS location option, so investigators could only establish or guess the location of the photos based on the surroundings that were visible. Another indication that the camera and SD card were safe from water damage is that the photos were recovered without any problems, aside from the one missing picture, picture 509. The first photos showed the girls in good spirits on April first, confirming that the woman had taken the Pianista trail and wandered somewhere into the wilderness hours before their first attempt to reach emergency services. The trip seemed to start being logged by the camera's SD card around picture 481 when they are about halfway up the Pianista trail and at around image 495, it is shown that they are taking selfies at the summit of the Pianista trail. At the summit of the Pianista trail, there seem to be some discrepancies in the time taken between each photo and the environments around them. Two photos of noticeable difference are images 499 and 500, ones that were taken six seconds apart and show completely different cloud coverage in the sky. The peak of the Pianista summit is also a key point in the timeline, as it was supposed to be the point in which Chris and Lasanne turned around to head back towards Boquet. However, as we can see from the next pictures on the camera, they did not actually turn around at the summit and continued to follow the trail further into the forest. The following pictures were taken after leaving the summit, ending with picture 508 and being the last image of the daytime of April 1st. It is unknown as to why the pictures stop at picture 508 and what happened between that last picture being taken and the first emergency call happening at 4.30 p.m. If we are to assume that Lasanne and Chris continued on the path after picture 508, then it is unknown as to how they could get lost and not simply turn around and follow the same path back to Boquet. It is unfortunate that no pictures or videos were taken to indicate why they called emergency services that afternoon. If the situation was dire enough to attempt to call emergency services, why would they not attempt to document what was happening in any way? It is understandable that they wanted to conserve their phone's batteries. However, the camera had a significantly longer battery life and still had battery when it was found 10 weeks later. Due to the lack of documentation, we are left to speculate a number of possible reasons for the calls to 112. One of the leading theories is that either Chris or Lasanne sustained a serious injury, thus preventing them from being able to easily make the multiple hour trek back to Boquette. The other theory suggests something much more nefarious. Perhaps Lasanne and Chris found they were being followed by a third party while venturing into the forest, and in fear of running into them, they decided not to turn around and venture further into the forest to the point that they are reasonably off track and sufficiently lost. However, we may never find out the answer to this question since the only data we have of April 1st daytime is up to picture 508. While it may seem a bit selfish for those of us looking at the case from the outside to be so wanting of documentation, it's not far-fetched to think they should have done it to some extent. Both the girls had handwritten diaries that journaled their ups and downs, so it is odd to see that given the extreme circumstance, they experience everything without leaving any sort of messages. The camera would not be used again until the middle of the night on April 8th, where an ominous string of 99 photos were taken between the times of 1.30 and 4.10 a.m. 
Initially, all but three photos were kept from the public, with investigators stating that they were dark and showed virtually nothing. Since 2019, we have now been provided with almost all of the photos, which are not quite as undistinguishable as we had been told. However, the three photos that we were shared created many more questions than answers. As these photos were taken in the middle of a pitch black jungle, we are only able to discern clearly what the flash on the camera has illuminated for us. In the first photo, we can see the holder of the camera is looking downward, perhaps off a cliff of some sort, at some bushes below. The second photo shows a twig with orange plastic wrapped around it, so that it could have been used as a possible flag to wave down any rescue teams in the area. The third and most haunting photo sticks out from the rest by a long shot. The photo is taken of the back of Chris's head, not giving any indication as to the status of Chris. However, we know from the phone data that just two days prior, Chris's phone had not been properly accessed via PIN code. The time gap between photo 508 and the nighttime photos is also a bit of a mystery, considering the first photo from the nighttime photos was labeled 510 meaning that there was a photo 509 and it was failed to be recovered. The fact that 510 is the first photo of the nighttime photos implies that 509 was taken sometime after 508 but deleted after 510 and the following photos were taken. Otherwise, the camera would have overridden the data as 509 being the starting picture for the nighttime photos. The main concerning factor about picture 509 is the manner in which it was deleted, adding many new questions to the case. Some tried to claim that the Canon PowerShot camera somehow accidentally skipped over picture 509 and skipped straight to 510, however Canon specialists have came back and said that is as good as impossible. On top of that, it would make no sense to say that the girls manually deleted the photo from the camera, considering there were 64 photos and 4 videos taken before March 28th that were deleted from the camera and partially recovered by police. Meaning that if it was deleted from the camera, the police should have been able to recover it using certain software. In fact, the only way that they could have possibly deleted the photo to the extent that a computer could not recover it afterwards is if the camera was somehow connected to a computer and the file was erased completely from there. When Dutch forensic investigators looked into this, they saw that the file sectors of photo 510 matched photo 508 seamlessly meaning that there was zero data in between and that it would have to be done through a computer. The worst part about the fact that picture 509 is the one missing is the fact that it takes place between picture 508, which was the last photo taken on the day of the disappearance, and picture 510, which starts off the nighttime photos that happened seven days later. This picture could have been taken at any time during that seven day time gap and we would never know considering all of the data of the photo has been deleted. Researchers have tested the Canon PowerShot camera to show that if the photo was deleted from the camera before picture 510 was taken, then the camera would have simply labeled that photo as 509. This means that the photo was taken between 508 and 510, but deleted sometime after the nighttime photos were taken. And since we now know that the photo was most likely deleted not with the use of the camera, but instead with the use of a computer, who would have deleted the photo? considering the girls did not have a computer with them and they were in the middle of a forest and didn't seem to have access to a computer at any time. And even on the off chance that somehow they did gain access to a computer, why would they delete one specific photo, then return the camera and SD card to the backpack where it would be found both together 10 weeks later? If we're still under the assumption that the photo was deleted by a computer, that could only mean that it was deleted sometime after the backpack was found, either in a villager's house or by the police themselves. After the discovery of the backpack and its contents, it was time for the police to go out and explore the area where the backpack was found and search there again. With the help of six Nagobe people, the local guide Feliciano then found bone remains in two different shoes along the river Rio Culebra, shortly before June 19th, 2014. It is also noted that a pair of Chris's jean shorts were found 
first said to be folded on top of a rock, but then later discovered to be attached to a twig in or above the river. The distance between where the backpack and the jean shorts was found was no less than a 14 hour walking distance. One of the shoes that was found was said to have belonged to Lasanne and actually contained her foot still inside of it, kept intact by the boot. Then the other bone remnants were found several walking hours away again as well, this time further up north. Amongst the remains of bones that were found were notably the foot of Lasanne and half of a pelvic bone from Chris. These showed entirely different stages of decomposition as Lasanne still had skin attached to the bone and Chris's bone seemed to be completely clean of flesh and even bleached. During autopsy investigations of Chris's bone and the lack of flesh on it, it was determined that this was not caused by scavenging animals as there were no scratches or teeth marks found on the bone and instead this was caused to some form of an accelerated decomposition. The coroner notably remarked that the most important bones such as the skull, the thorax bones, or pelvic girdle were not found and would possibly establish the cause of death for the victims. Later on, additional femur and tibia bones were found belonging to Lasanne, as well as a piece of balled up flesh that was still in an early stage of decomposition even though it was found five months after their disappearance. It was also found that a rib was discovered belonging to Chris amongst other remains that belonged to other people, one to an infant and one to an old woman. These individuals were never identified specifically, but we do know that they do not belong to Chris. In total, authorities were really only able to gather bones from Lasanne's foot and subsequent leg, as well as Chris's pelvic bone and her rib. Most of the other main crucial bones that could have discerned a cause of death were left undiscovered. Considering the state of the bones in Lasanne's foot found in her boot, it was shown to have been broken in three places. Investigators stated that this is consistent with a fall from great height, but not exclusively limited to a fall, saying it's a 50% likelihood. Panamanian authorities, however, took this and stated that the broken metatarsal bones prove a fall. However, it is also possible that she could have sustained this injury from taking blunt force impact to the top of the foot. Additionally, if she were to fall from a great height, she would have broken many more bones in her body. However, the leg bone that we recovered was not broken in this way. Pertaining to the state of Chris's bones, the bleaching and phosphorus found in the bones brought up many questions. The leading theory for the discoloration was that it was primarily from sun bleaching. However, this and the lack of phosphate in the surrounding soil failed to explain the phosphorus found on the bones. Despite not knowing the reason for the bareness and the bleaching of Chris's bones, the main concerns come from the differences in both Lasanne and Chris's remains. According to authorities' theories, these girls were together most, if not the whole time, in the same human rainforest for the same amount of time. Why is it then that Lasanne was hardly decomposed at all, and Chris's bones were completely bare and bleached? It is more than likely that Lasanne and Chris died at different times, however that could only account for a few days difference in the same environment. This alone could not explain the vast difference in decomposition. And again, without the discovery of the major bones that could explain their causes of death, it would seem that the Panamanian authorities jumped to a conclusion that neatly summarizes a lump of contradicting evidence. I believe here would be a good point to end the summarization of the case and move on to the theories that explain what happened to the girls as well as my personal thoughts. Now when it comes to the actual theories of the case, I do not necessarily agree with the official Panamanian uh, authorities declaration that the girls were simply lost in the forest and succumbed to the elements. There are certainly a lot of reasons that that can be believed, and I think it's true that 11 days in a rainforest, the, if these girls were truly lost, they would easily succumb to dehydration and uh, starvation. However, I don't believe that that's the full story. I think it's a very easy cop-out to kind of summarize uh, all the evidence that we've gained as just the girls getting lost in the forest and never being found until 10 weeks later when we find some remains. I think that 
the combination of evidence that we received in the state of their remains and uh, the contents of the backpack serve heavily into my theories, as well as uh, some of the eyewitness and um, reported testimony of the events surrounding uh, the immediate disappearance of the girls. I think those are often left out of official reports all because they claim that they don't need them. Um, a lot of eyewitness testimony that contradicts uh, times that the girls were supposedly there. Um, they calculated the camera time saying that it couldn't possibly be any later than 11 o'clock when the taxi driver claimed to have dropped them off around 1.30, 1.40, something like that. Um, these were quickly just thrown away as they got the camera data and said, well, this is the brand new data. We don't need any of that prior testimony, which I think is just poor policemanship. I don't think that that's how you should handle the case. It should be more of we're fitting this all into the puzzle as opposed to, oh, look, we just got a new set of puzzle pieces. Let's put these together. These pieces don't fit anymore. That's not the proper way to handle the case. And I believe in my honest opinion, that's how the Panamanian government handled this. I think that uh, part of my speculation about the case is also the manner in which a lot of the evidence was obtained. Um, back to the point of them not really focusing on what happened around the events of the actual disappearance, it was actually stated in a few reports that the first person to fully note that the girls had gone missing and where they had possibly gone missing from was that tour guide Feliciano. I had mentioned him previously in the video but didn't really bring him up as a potential suspect or anything and I still don't necessarily consider him to be a suspect. I just think that his involvement in the case kind of oversteps that of just a typical volunteer. He reportedly came to the host family's home on the 2nd of April and was there first thing in the morning saying that the girls had missed their appointment with him, which I don't think was even officially confirmed anywhere to have been scheduled. Um, he just claimed that he had an appointment with the girls on the 2nd that they failed to show up for. This was enough for Miriam to not only let him into the house, but also uh, used the spare key to open up the girl's bedroom. And I think that at this point, it would be reasonable if he just looked in and went, they're not here, but I know where they went. That's still a stretch because why does he know exactly where they went? Um, but he didn't just look in there and see if they were there. He was in there for at least 13 minutes, and this is well before the police were ever involved. After this, he went to the trail and searched it for himself and didn't actually get in contact with authorities until so late into the day on April 2nd that authorities didn't even begin their search of the area until April 3rd. Um, I think that this was just bad planning and he was kind of the one that tipped them off that they had to be at the Pianista Trail. Um, I think that there might have been some CCTV footage and also, like I said, the testimony from the taxi driver did put them at the Pianista Trail just later on when they found the camera it wasn't the specific time that they were looking for um, they just said that he was wrong even though I think there was another witness from the language school that said that they saw them leave that area around 1 p.m. putting him in a taxi having the taxi drop them off around 1 30 that would all kind of correlate correctly uh, however, the camera data shows them supposedly there around 11 o'clock. I think that the camera data isn't entirely correct because they did have to adjust the data. Um, I think it told them that it was the year 2013 and it was also adjusted six hours ahead, which should have technically been seven hours ahead uh, if it was adjusted for Netherlands time. Um, it's a manually adjusted clock, uh, so it could be, you know, a few hours off for all we know, but from relation to what we can see in the actual photos and the position of the sun, uh, we have a rough estimate as of the time of day and adjust based on that. 
uh, especially with the nighttime photos that I think were logged at closer to like 7 or 8 a.m. is what it was saying. Even though it was pitch black, it was very clear that it was much closer to 1 in the morning to 4 in the morning. Um, but my point to Feliciano is that not only was he one of the first people to get involved with the case, he also was the first person that was contacted by the person that found the backpack. The backpack which the witness actually claimed had she had gone to that spot numerous times and the backpack was not there the day before when she had checked that it was just there that following day. So she gets there and finds this backpack and then contacts Feliciano and then he gives the backpack to authorities a day later. I find that just a little odd as to why we just accept that as okay. Um, I mean, who knows how many people that went through at the time before it even reached authorities and that probably adds up to the reason that we have 34 different fingerprints, none of which were even tested. Uh, we do have numerous DNA samples that were taken. Those were tested, none of them even came back as Lasan and Chris, I think that just this mishandling alone could have caused all that, uh, you know, exiting out foul play entirely. I think that the mishandling of the evidence is the reason that we have such muddy DNA evidence uh, when it comes to the backpack. Uh, I just think that that was all poorly handled. And on top of that, when authorities decided to start searching the area afterwards, the area around where they found the backpack, the first people to find remains was Feliciano and his team. Uh, it just seemed oddly convenient that I never really read any reports about authorities who went out there with sniffer dogs numerous times. Uh, they used helicopters. None of them ever seemed to be the ones that actually found the evidence. They booked it, but they weren't the ones to actually find it. So, with the poor handling of the evidence, I think that brings just the whole uh, situation with the Panamanian police into question. A lot of people would like to say, well, Occam's razor, uh, the simplest answer is often the correct one. However, I don't think that we can just say the simplest answer is correct when the authorities handled the case so awfully. Uh, we don't they, they made even what could have been simple answers poorly represented because there was so much so much mismanagement with the case we couldn't solidly put uh, any of this together ourselves and then reasonably say yep they got lost in the jungle I think that a lot of the skepticism about the case would be uh, a little bit lower or just less heard of if the authorities had actually done their job properly. Um, if they had investigated every mean of um, every route possible with the case. Um, I, and that actually goes for the Dutch investigators too. Um, they didn't really seem to be bothered by the fact that all of the evidence that they gathered, or at least the majority of the evidence that they gathered, went through the Panamanian uh, police first. Uh, and they just kind of regurgitated what they said. Yes, they had first-hand uh, look at the evidence, but at the same time, it's that evidence, the same stuff that has been, I wouldn't say tampered, but kind of muddied by the poor uh, handling of the Panamanian police and the volunteers that they allowed to handle a lot of the evidence without protective gloves or anything. Uh, oftentimes, pieces of bone fragment and stuff were told where they were found, uh, but they were brought to the police without actually uh, photographing and uh, showing exactly where it was found. They didn't bring the police to the scene of where it was found. They brought it to the police. I believe that was the case with the jean shorts that they found from Chris. Uh, that's why there was a lot of um, skepticism about the story of whether or not it was found folded up on a rock or if it was found floating in the river. I think the official police report states that it was sort of in the river. It was attached to like a branch that was keeping it from flowing away. So it was, at, depending on the level of the water at the time, it was either kind of dipped in the water or not. But regardless, it was kind of hanging on this branch. It was stuck there. Um, that 
They could have done a better job at letting these volunteers know, hey, we would like to see where this happened. We have general locations of where the stuff was found, and the map doesn't make any sense at all. Uh, a lot of the remains were found much further north of where the backpack was found, which doesn't make sense when you go with their theory of, well, the girls died somewhere near the river and the remains were floated down. Why did the backpack go further down without any clear water damage to any of the technology or contents inside? Yes, it was a little bit more roughed up and not in pristine condition like some reports might say, but it definitely didn't look like a backpack that had been out in the elements for 72 plus days, as well as a camera and two phones that all were fully operational despite, I mean, the phones having dead batteries, but uh, that's what technology does over time. Sitting out in the rainforest for 72 days with like rainy seasons, um, regardless of if it was in the river or not, it just seems odd that all of it was in perfect condition and again, uh, going back to the fact that the backpack looked to be as if it was placed there by somebody. The woman said that it was not in that exact spot the day before, and it couldn't have possibly been floated by the river. Um, she found it by the river, but she didn't find it in the river, and it wasn't necessarily wet, nor were the contents damaged. If it was floated by the river, it would have likely uh, severely damaged the technology inside. It was more than likely placed there by somebody. Again, it could have been a villager or something nearby. They know that they were looking for this, but they didn't want to get directly involved with the case, so they might have placed it there. Uh, that's always a possibility. There's, you know, usually ne less nefarious reasons for things like this to happen, but regardless of whether it was nefarious or not, the authorities were negligent on handling a lot of this information. I'd like to apologize, by the way, if I am not in focus. Ah, this is the first time I've had my camera set up in this position, and it's a little hard to go back and check all this crap. Um, the monitor on my camera is fine, but the actual uh, putting it on the computer makes it show whether or not I'm in focus a lot better. So, getting back into the case, um, I'd like to say that uh, I think. Feliciano definitely had some involvement um, knowing that the girls were at the trail. I don't immediately suspect him as somebody nefarious or a nefarious third party, but his uh, involvement should have been uh, something that the police and other authorities actually looked into more. Because just ignoring it altogether I think is a problem. Uh, he was definitely too conveniently attached to the case. Um, especially even 10 weeks later when he's the first person that is contacted about the backpack and its contents. That's just suspicious to me. Um, aside from that, uh, let's talk about the actual contents of the backpack. Uh, the phone data does show that the girls were in distress uh, at a very early time during their trip. They did try to contact authorities uh, pretty early on in the day, around 4 o'clock, I think, something like that, um, which is just a few hours after they were on their trip, and if it lines up with the camera data correctly, it would be two or three hours after the final daytime photo was taken. Um, then after that, it was a little bit suspicious, but I guess... Um, I think I saw somebody explain it online that the schedule of the times a day that they would turn on their phone, attempt to call authorities, and then turn it off correlated with the times that the sun was setting and rising uh, above and below the uh, mountains, uh, the Pianista Trail. So it, since they didn't have watches or anything to know the time, I guess it was just happenstance that they were calling at this time of day. A lot of people online say that it's kind of odd that they made these calls for very limited times, kind of as if it was on a workday schedule. Um, I agree it is odd, but it can again be explained away with just uh, happenstance uh, occurrences. Um, on top of that, the phone data, I believe one thing it does for sure show is that 
Whether she was incapacitated or passed away, I believe after the fifth day being the last day that uh, Chris's phone was accessed properly with the pin code, um, I believe that past then she was no longer either conscious or even alive. Um, Lasan was most likely alive during the events of the nighttime photos. That's also unclear. Uh, we can most certainly tell that that's the back of Chris's head in one of the photos, but we don't know who exactly is taking it or for what purpose they are taking it. I think it's a little bit hasty to try and assume that a third party is taking this in some elaborate ploy uh, at three in the or one thirty to four in the morning, trying to fool investigators later on. Um, taking almost a hundred pictures over the span of two and a half hours uh, and making it look like the girls are in some creepy situation I think that it's very likely that if we are to go by what the officials at the Panamanian government say um, Lasan seems to be the one taking the pictures and at this point, she's been out in the wilderness for eight days. She's probably suffering heavily from dehydration uh, and possibly hallucinating. Uh, I know that the photos are very still and intentional, um, and it seems as though she's not very it's that she's not physically incapacitated enough to take quality pictures. It just seems like she doesn't have much to take pictures of. Um, but with the hallucination thing, she might have been taking these pictures thinking that she was seeing something. That's also possible. I think that's all kind of a mystery. Um, either way, the nighttime photos don't make a ton of sense to me, especially considering the fact that we haven't really figured out where they are. Um, it does seem obvious that they are not very close to the Pianista Trail at this point in time especially when you consider where the remains and the backpack were found, uh, over 18 kilometers away from the Pianista, uh, in a completely different, they, they would have had to cross two different rivers to get to this location. Uh, and they clearly probably knew this, but I guess they did or didn't know. It's all up for speculation, and that's what makes this case so confusing and frustrating that the Panamanian government was very quick to say, nope, this is a cut and clear answer. Next, I'd like to talk about the missing photo 509. A lot of people want to point to that and say that that implies the foul play. However, I think personally, this could also just wrap back to my point about the police negligence. Um, I already went over the fact that this file couldn't have simply just been deleted from the camera, nor could it have, I mean, if it was deleted from the camera in between 508 and 510, uh, then the camera would have simply overridden it and then put the first nighttime photo as labeled as 509. So this file was deleted after the nighttime photos were taken. For all we know, it could be the first nighttime photo, or it could have taken place on April 1st. It's actually somewhere in that whole time span. Um, and for all we know, it could be completely useless information. But at the same time, the lack of it is uh, something that is worth talking about. It was clearly deleted by a computer, which in and of itself is probably to me pointing to the fact that detectives um, did one of two things they either accidentally deleted it and didn't want to talk about it because the only way that this could be deleted and be fully wiped out non-recoverable is if it was deleted from a computer they either accidentally deleted it or there is the possibility that they deleted it with it uh, knowing that it contained um, evidence of foul play that they didn't want to actually show to the public. Uh, it could have had clear-cut evidence of maybe the face of a third party. It could have been something more gruesome. It could have shown one of the girls injured. Um, it could have shown that they were in contact with somebody else. It 
could have been a video for all we know. Um, that it could have been a million things, but speculating on what it could have been isn't that helpful because we don't have it. At the end of the day, all the best that we can do is focus on how exactly it disappeared. And the fact that it's gone at all, to me, shows that the authorities got rid of it somehow, either on purpose or on accident. Uh, the only other possibility is that somehow the SD card got in the hands of somebody with a computer and it was deleted from the camera knowing that you needed to delete it with a computer uh, so that it couldn't be recovered uh, later on in investigations, then put back into the backpack before the backpack, which I still believe was planted, uh, planted to the spot that it was found. That doesn't make as much sense to me as it does that the authorities had something to do with the missing photo. Um, again, it could have been on purpose or on accident. I think that either is just as likely. Uh, and I think that's the only explanation for it. Uh, the fact that Lisanne and Chris's parents didn't try to look into this a little bit more um, kind of concerns me. Uh, maybe they were told about it and they do know about it and they didn't think it was much of a big deal. I'm not sure. But this kind of moves on to my next point when I spoke of how 509 could have been a video. I think the lack of documentation is very, very out of character for the two girls. Yes, they were in a state of panic, and it is easy for us on the outside to look at this and say, well, why didn't they keep track of A, B, or C? Why didn't they show what went down? That's a good point, because a lot of people in panic don't first think to document things, but you would think by day two, they would be leaving something behind. There were no unsent text messages, no notes in their phones. The phones were only ever used for, I think, uh, other than contacting authorities, they used the weather app. And I think Chris opened WhatsApp at one point uh, and searched a very specific contact name. I didn't think that was a very significant point of evidence, so I didn't mention it in the initial part of the video, but it was used for that. Uh, but they didn't otherwise use the phone for documenting anything. And who knows, maybe after Chris was incapacitated after day five and Lasanne was trying to enter the phone, maybe she was trying to enter the phone to do just that. But clearly by day eight, she realized that this camera, whose battery was still alive when they found the camera 10 weeks later, uh, could document whatever they needed. And yet she just took a string of almost a hundred photos that don't really give much information. That camera had video function. She didn't leave a goodbye message or anything. Surely by day eight, she's desperate and has lost a little bit of hope to the point where she would think, maybe I need to leave a goodbye message for my parents and my loved ones. That confuses me, and on top of that, these girls, when I say it was out of character for them to not leave documentation, both of them had written diaries that they had been using for the whole span of their vacation before the events. So I know it wasn't necessarily in their character to keep video and photo documentation of all the events around them, but I don't think that small sets of panic would stop them from doing that, especially if they figured that hope was lost, but there's a possibility that the technology with them might be found. I think most people would cling to that one sliver of hope that even if you don't make it out of there, your message will. And that is a little bothersome to me, and that's another reason why I think that the evidence doesn't really add up a lot. It was supposed to close a lot of doors when they introduced the evidence of the contents of the backpack. But for me, it just added a bunch of questions because the camera data didn't answer much. The phone data just showed once a day they would turn on their phones and try to contact authorities. And eventually, uh, one of the phones was unaccessible because they couldn't figure out the pin key. That adds more questions than answers. Uh, it doesn't really tell me what they were doing at the time, nor actually hearing about the fact that they were in distress so early on 
uh, kind of adds the question, did they find out they were lost that early on? Typically, you don't call authorities as soon as you get lost. You try to, you think that you can figure it out on your own, and then as a last ditch effort, you try to call authorities. And they called while there was still daylight out. So that makes me think that they got injured, but at the same time, they seem to have traveled a great distance over those days, so how could they have possibly gotten injured and traveled that far? It makes it so that none of these theories really add up completely. I can't really settle on one. Personally, again, I think that foul play is probably the best theory, but also not the correct word to use for it because I, if we're going to consider foul play as a viable option, I think it's just as viable to say that the Panamanian government and those that were helping handle the evidence are just as complicit in whatever happened to the girls. So I'd like to wrap this up by kind of giving a summary of what I believe happened. I think that the girls went on their hike uh, as was listed, I think that the time of day discrepancy is a bit off and there's actually more to the story with the taxi driver. He was actually found dead a year later, supposedly from drowning. That's not something I'd like to get into in this video. We're really, really, if we really wanted to, we could dig a lot deeper and figure out more about this, but I'd like to stick to just the specifics of the case as the evidence that I've laid out so far. Um, I think they went on the trail. I think they went past the summit as shown in picture uh, pictures 502 through 508, 505 through 508, something around there. I think it was very clear that the girls went past the peak of the summit and I think this was to visit some of the other locations that they had researched prior to actually going on the trip. Um, I think they believe that they could easily get to that with the amount of daylight that they had left before having to turn around. Now, after picture 508 and those few hours uh, between that time that that picture was taken and then the first calls to authorities were made, I think there are two possibilities as to what could have happened. Um, they either went so deep on a trail that they weren't familiar with that they were lost to the point where they couldn't even turn around and follow the path straight back to Phuket because that was the only possible real route to get back after traveling to Pianista was to just head backwards and follow the same path. I think that they were so lost and in those few hours they thought well we're not so lost that we need to call authorities we could probably find this on our own until some point of desperation kicked in and they went holy crap we're lost and they completely freaked out and called authorities i think that that's most likely i think the other option is that somehow they saw a third party um and this is into the foul play argument um a third party was following them probably not from super close but at least from a distance enough that the girls were sufficiently scared and they saw this and did not want to turn back so they actually went deeper into the forest and then became sufficiently lost whether this person kept following them or not again is still under the assumption that there was somebody following them to begin with uh, this could be the ex explanation for picture 509 this could have been of that person. That picture could have been taken on April 1st, but we'll never know. Um, I think that onward, I think the main explanation for what happened for the next five, six days is that the girls exhibited just the typical signs of being lost. They tried to call authorities at certain times of the day, correlating with when they would be receiving sunlight in the funk, in the forest uh i think this is just correlating with their sleep schedule and they knew that they had limited battery life so they did it at very uh specific times of the day um they were traveling we know that much i don't understand why they were traveling uh i think that a lot of hikers say that 
uh, ideal thing to do when you're lost is to hug a tree. And they mean that not literally, but to essentially stay put because that's going to be your biggest chance at having uh, search and rescue teams find you. And if these girls are under the assumption that somebody's going to notice that they're missing and that they're going to send search and rescue teams, the best thing they could have done was to stay put. But it seems that they traveled very far away to the point that uh, by the eighth day when they were searching, uh, they probably weren't even close to the area that search and rescue teams were looking in. Now, I think it was obvious that whether it be to dehydration and starvation or due to an injury, something happened to Chris by the fifth day where she was no longer the one accessing her phone and the pin code was not being entered correctly. I think that, again, in my opinion, I don't believe this was a third party trying to access her phone. I think this was Lisan. Uh, it is also very possible that at this point, I, while I do still think that the women were lost for the first five, six days, a third party could have came into play at this point, and that could have been the person that was trying to access Chris's phone. However, the access to Chris's phone also correlates with the same time that Lasanne's phone died. So I think that it would make sense that Lasanne was the one trying to do it. Why she was trying to get into it? That's still kind of a mystery because she was still able to call emergency services without unlocking the phone. So there was no real reason for her to need to unlock the phone. And if it was to document something, again, she could have used the camera. And that camera had a long battery life. I don't understand why that never came into her mind. Now, for, as for the nighttime photos, I think at this point the girls were posted up somewhere. And I think it's quite possible that they had been there for a few days because Chris was clearly shown in one of the pictures and like I said I don't believe she was if even if she was not dead um, I believe that she was probably incapacitated and not mobile past the fifth day so I believe that they had been in that same spot since the fifth day the timing of the photos doesn't really make sense um, when you put it into perspective that they actually shot 99 photos something like that a lot of them were looking up at the sky, so clearly they're not using the flash to look around. That All that would do in a pitch black forest is blind you. What they could have been doing is shooting it up in the air to possibly get the attention of somebody uh, that they thought, maybe like a rescue team that they saw in the area, um, and they could have been trying to get their attention. I think that the screams in the forest would probably travel a lot farther, but there could have been good reason as to why they thought to do these photos they they seemed systematic and not shaky but at the same time they didn't seem like they were taken of anything particular aside from the one that's the back of Chris's head um, that photo is also a little bit uh, not detailed because some have speculated that Chris has injuries to her head but it's not super obvious to me when looking at the photo um, she has red hair and people say that there was dried up blood, but I don't really see it um, And then finally the Chris's iPhone was used for one last time for a full hour on the 11th day, so If we're under the assumption that it was just the girls using this then Somebody was somebody presumably uh, Lizanne was alive until the 11th day and then that was the last time the phone was powered on I do not believe the girls made it past this, however, um, the state of decomposition shows that Lisanne might have lived on even past that, and the fact that both of the phones and the camera and everything, these weren't kept on their person, they were all neatly and collected into the backpack that Lisanne was carrying, and was not with their remains. Uh, that is where I think the foul play actually might have came in. If somebody didn't do something to these girls while they were alive, I think that somebody tried to cover up something after they had died. I think that it was in the Panamanian government's best interest to keep this case simple as the girls just got lost and succumbed to the elements. I think that 
uh, since six the six percent of their GDP is tourism, it would look very bad if, say, this was actually a homicide case. And I think a lot of people still believe that there is at least some essence of foul play involved. Uh, I personally think that we can't even get to that uh, decision with all the evidence that we've been given because all the evidence is so mixed up and so awfully put together that uh, there it's hard to say that the Panamanian government's decision was truthful or that there is foul play. I think both of which are extremely hard conclusions to come to. Um, but that's just my take on the matter. Now, I would love to hear any arguments to anything that I've said. I think I'm trying to be as realistic as possible, including what most of I've heard online, aside from a few outliers, like uh, some saying that a lot of the photos recovered, even the daytime ones are photoshopped, um, and that total eyewitness testimony disputes a lot of this. I didn't want to get into any of that because that's just getting crazier than I kind of signed on for with this. But I think that my final conclusion is that the girls did get lost. There probably was a third party, whether it be before they died or sometime shortly after they died. I think that there was involvement that covered up these girls' deaths. I think that backpack was planted. Uh, I do not believe the, uh, the uh, parts of the backpack, or the contents of the backpack that were found in such pristine condition it was just a coincidence. I think that that is sketchy. I think that the Panamanian government failed their job. I think that the Dutch investigators didn't do the best job either. Um, either way, I think that the justice system failed these families um, and failed to properly answer what happened to these girls. And that's just the best that I can say because I don't think I can give a definite answer on how they died or what exactly happened. All I can say is that this investigation was a failure all the way through. So as I wrap up the video, I would like to thank uh, Scarlett R and her blog. Uh, I will link it down below as well as Juan who has been researching this case since 2014. Uh, he provided a Google album with the majority of the photos that I used in the first part of this video. Um, both of them have done extensive research and have been updating the case uh, as they've been finding out new information over the years. I think that if I had made this uh, video a couple years ago, I wouldn't have half of the information that I have now, and it wouldn't have been nearly as detailed. Uh, so I'd like to thank them. I will link it all down below. I highly suggest that you check it out afterwards. Uh, they have a lot more details in the case than I have provided here. Um, I've just kind of summarized to my best what I found from them. Uh, so thank you for watching if you stuck around this long. Uh, that's about it for the video. I might make a follow-up if I feel like this didn't really get the point across. But that's about it. Thank you.